Welcome to predicting solubility of ionic compounds. In lesson 9.2, we mentioned how not all ionic compounds are soluble. And then again, in lesson 9.11, we saw that insoluble compounds precipitate out of solution. In this lesson, we're going to look at some general rules or guidelines that allow us to predict the solubility of compounds based on the ions in those compounds. So by the end of this lesson, we're going to be able to predict the solubility of a compound just by looking at the ions that make up that compound. The guidelines or rules for solubility generally fall into one of two categories. Ions that form soluble compounds and ions that form insoluble compounds. And just to keep life interesting for us, we're going to see that there are always going to be exceptions to each one of these cases. So for the ions that form soluble compounds, there's going to be exceptions to these rules. And for ions that form insoluble compounds, we'll see some exceptions as well. Now before I start going into what some of these rules or guidelines are, it's important to note that this is not going to be a comprehensive list. I'm going to try and identify the most important or most common rules as a baseline, but you should know that there are more that exist that would provide a more complete picture of what's soluble and what's insoluble. So that said, let's get started at looking at what some of these very common rules are, and the ones that are, I think, best to know. The first of these, I think, is the most important. All ions of alkali metals, which are the group 1 elements, the group 1A elements, and the ammonium ion. All compounds that contain these ions, alkali metals or the ammonium ion, are going to be soluble. There are no exceptions to this rule, so it's a very useful one to know. The second rule also has no exceptions, making it equally useful. And that is that any compounds containing nitrate, chlorate, or acetate ions are also always going to be soluble, no exceptions. The next two are important to mention because they do come up often, but they do have some exceptions we need to pay attention to. The third rule says that halide ions are soluble. That means the chloride ion, the bromide ion, and the iodide ion. However, there are exceptions to this. These ions will be soluble when they're with any other element except for a silver ion, a lead ion, or the mercury one ion. Rule 4 says that compounds with a sulfate ion are also soluble. So the SO4- minus ion, when that shows up, that's generally going to be soluble. Now this one has exceptions too. Now when remembering the exceptions, some of them are pretty common and easy to remember. So Ag+, plus, the silver ion, and the lead ion, the lead 2 ion, are both exceptions to solubility for sulfate. If you see Ag with SO4 or Pb with SO4, that's going to be insoluble because it's an exception to this all sulfates are soluble rule. Now, there are more exceptions as well. And these other exceptions are typically group two metals. Not all the group two metals, but specifically calcium, strontium, and barium. These ions show up as an exception to sulfates. And this group of three is going to be a nice one to remember because it shows up as an exception for insoluble as well. But these are the four primary rules to remember for knowing which ions form soluble compounds. Now we're going to look at the ions that form insoluble compounds. And the first one of those, which is our fifth rule, is going to be that all hydroxides are insoluble. That's the OH- ion. Now, there are exceptions to this, specifically rule 1. And you're going to see that rule 1 takes precedence over any other, because they have no exceptions. So rule 1 is going to be an exception for this hydroxides being insoluble rule. But also, we have that little trio of group 2 metals, calcium, strontium, and barium. These ions, this group of three, they are also exceptions to this hydroxides being insoluble rule. The last helpful one to remember is that phosphates, carbonates, and sulfides are always insoluble, with the only exception being the rule 1 case, the alkali metals and ammonium ion. Now let's see how we can use this information to predict the solubility of a compound. Given any salt, so let's use MgSO4 as an example, magnesium sulfate. Given any salt, the first thing you want to do is look at the individual ions. So for magnesium sulfate, that's going to be the Mg2 plus ion and the SO4 2 minus ion, magnesium and sulfate. Next, we're going to look for any relevant rules that apply to either the magnesium ion or the sulfate ion. So first, we're going to look for magnesium, some rule that may apply to magnesium. If I look through my list here, uh, we have alkali metals as positive ions, um, but that's really the only rule for positive ions, and magnesium is not an alkali metal. It's a group 2 metal. So I don't have a rule for magnesium. 
but now let's check for sulfate. If I look through my list here, I do have a rule for sulfate right here, and sulfate falls under my rules for ions that form soluble compounds. I'm just going to check the exceptions to make sure that magnesium is not an exception to this rule, which it's not. So because the rule tells me that SO4 is soluble, and I can see that magnesium is not an exception, I can say that this compound, magnesium sulfate, is soluble. And I'm going to indicate this by writing an AQ next to magnesium sulfate, indicating that in water, magnesium sulfate exists as these two ions, Mg2 plus and SO4 two minus. Let's take a look at one more compound as an example. We'll look at lead iodide. You may remember this compound as the yellow precipitate that showed up in lesson 9.11. So let's run through our steps. The first thing we're going to do is look at the individual ions. So that's going to be the Pb2 plus ion and the iodide ion. Next, I'm going to look for any relevant rules for either one of these ions. Let's start by looking for Pb. If I look through my list of rules, I'm not going to see Pb show up in either the soluble or insoluble list. But it's good to keep in mind that the lead ion does show up as an exception for some of these solubility rules. So I couldn't find a rule for the lead ion, but I did note that it shows up as an exception for some other rules. Now let's look for the iodide ion. The iodide ion shows up in the halides rule, saying that it is always soluble unless it's combined with the silver, lead, or mercury-1 ions. So as we said, iodine is a halide, which means that it's always soluble, except when it's with the ion silver, lead, or mercury-1. And we can clearly see that this iodide is with lead, so it's an exception to being always soluble. Therefore, this is going to be insoluble. And if this were present in an aqueous solution, I would write it as PBI2 with an S to indicate it's a solid and not dissolved in the water. In your notes, use the solubility rules we talked about to determine if K3PO4, potassium phosphate, is soluble or insoluble. That wraps up our lesson on predicting the solubility of ionic compounds. Write down any questions you have in your notes and bring them with you to class.